the guy we want might not be there at pick 28 is a scenario Bean has to be ready for. And whether that is, you know, I don't know, maybe they have Xavier Worthy as their wide receiver for, maybe they love Lad McConkey. Maybe they love Xavier Leggett. I know Joe Marino has Xavier Leggett above Brian Thomas Jr. Maybe Thomas Jr. is their guy, but wherever that falls, if it starts to go the wrong way and their guy goes way earlier than they expect, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, we're not going to trade up for one of these other guys. They got to be ready to pivot. And what does that mean? Do you now reach, do you take your wide receiver eight at pick 28 when you could get defensive tackle one or edge rusher three or safety one or, you know, a starting center for the next decade? You know, that it, they're going to have to weigh that of what does it do? Or is that where we hope that somebody wants Michael Penix or Bo Nix and wants to trade up and maybe we move back a little bit? And then still take whoever we want at receiver. I just they need to be ready for that contingent. I think I know ninety percent of the fan base just wants a wide receiver and probably a wide receiver trade up. We got to be ready that it may not fall that way. Yeah, definitely not. Especially with the way some of these. I mean, we don't necessarily know yet until the night of, but just from the words that have everyone's been talking about, like these wide receivers are valued high, and if you you, you might have to trade up and go get them if you really love a guy. So I'm 90% of my brain agrees with you. And I think that's the more likely one. There's a little, there's a little (laughs) sliver of me that wonders after the top three, those top three are locked in. I maybe one of them. Harrison neighbors and Odunze, right? We're all yes. Harrison jr. Malik neighbors, Roma Dunze. I think that those three each would be wide receiver one in most of the drafts in the last 10 or 15 years. They're that good. Um, Once you get past there, I wonder if how deep that second tier is, does that almost make it the reverse where so many teams in the mid to late first know that, hey, we do like some of these guys, but I also like Ricky Pearsall and I also like Roman Wilson and I also like Jalen Polk and I also like, and they rattle off 12 receivers in that second tier and they tell themselves that, hey, the drop off at edge is terrible. The drop off at you know offensive tackle is it's a deep group, but once it drops off, it's really deep. Yep. Uh, the drop off at corner is really really deep. What if those teams decide, hey, I like this defensive tackle plus the receiver I can still get in the second versus Brian Thomas Jr. and the defensive tackle I can get in the second. If enough teams do that, I actually think there's a chance that the wide receivers maybe dominate the second round more than the first round. And again, I, I think it's more likely that we see a run and they go early, but there's a piece of me that wonders is the depth of the class almost going to hurt that second tier a little bit. Cause guys will be like, yeah, we still like that. We like Xavier Leggett just as much as Brian Thomas jr. We'll pick him at 40 rather than picking this guy at 15. Yeah. I could definitely see, a scenario where that possibly could happen or <laughs> the complete opposite where the top three yeah. guys go. And it's just, okay, there's enough guys that we have valued the same and maybe we could wait till the second or third round and go get yeah. them. So with that yeah, being and- said, now that we're on that topic, um, we seen the brand of being presser the other day. He mentioned that they only had, they don't even have 28 guys uh, valued in at the first round rank. So what's your thoughts on the presser? What was your big takeaway from that? Um, I think he it's one of the times where he's, you know, as transparent as any GM. I think that he does share a fair amount of things. I, you know, he obviously joked about taking a receiver every round and, and different pieces like that. But I think that's that's true. It's almost impossible to have 20, 32 first round grades. I don't think any team in just about any year has 30 first round grades. So all the teams picking in the late first it's all relative. You know, sometimes you, one of your guys falls and you have a guy that's rated there. Um, But in general, I think that's pretty accurate. You know, he shared some things about, I thought he was, he and Josh and McDermott were all pretty gracious about the Stefan Diggs thing. I didn't expect them to take any shots, but they didn't, they were, they were pretty gracious about that. And I think they tried to downplay how big of a need receiver is. And I think that might've been the one, area that was maybe a little bit performative a little bit of lip service because you know they needed a receiver when they still had digs i think bean even said he was like wide receiver one eh, who cares we don't need them we got a bunch of guys and if we find a guy that we like in the draft then whatever he might not be wide receiver one but we'll we'll throw him in the mix we got yeah that sounds great (laughs) 
But yeah, it's it's obviously they're they, it's a significant need, but it doesn't help him to go out there and be like, oh my god, we need a receiver really bad. Please don't trade ahead of us to take one of our receivers. Like, <laughs> what's he gonna say? You know, he's he's kind of stuck. Exactly. Um. So with that being said, what is your who? Give us a list. Your top wide receiver prospects for this draft since since it's we essentially the number one need for the Buffalo Bills. So, you know, I, I've been accused of not liking him, and I think it because I have tried to pull it back. A lot of people in my mind has Brian Thomas Jr. like wide receiver four, and the top three are awesome. So the fourth guy's also awesome, and I think it's three receivers and then a big gap, and then the rest of the guys. But I do still have Brian Thomas Jr. as my fourth receiver. Like he's big and fast and super athletic and explosive, catches the deep ball really well. I just I think he's in that next tier, but the first guy. Um, I like Xavier Leggett a lot. I think he looks like AJ Brown to me. I get it that I get the the statistical profile sets off a lot of analytics nerds red flags. Guy breaking out in his fifth year doesn't look great. He is a little bit older. If you just look at his 2023 film, he's a top 10 pick. Like, he's a freak. So I'm good taking a risk on that when it looks like that. When you're 6'1 and change, 225, and run a 4'3'9 with the kind of performance he put up, I'm good with that. Yeah. Um, I do understand the risks and some of the things that have come out on A.D. Mitchell. So I, I, yeah. I'm curious. He would be one... Um, similar to Leatu Latu, the the DN from UCLA, where the pick would be self fulfilling. Where if he's on the board and the Bills pass, it's a oh for Mitchell, it would be oh the background check stuff didn't check out, or for Latu, it's oh hey they failed him on the physicals. And if they take him, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden I think they're like super risky and just willing to take big risks. It means that their research checked out. And that their medicals on Latu or the background stuff on Mitchell wasn't the crap we heard on social media, and that they checked out fine, and that no, that stuff's not right. Reed Ferguson is diabetic and manages it perfectly well on the team. That's not a red flag. Uh, Mark Andrews is diabetic and manages it perfectly well. Um, so I have no reason to think AD Mitchell can't do that. There were comments about that he doesn't run all his routes as fast as possible every single time. That just yeah, might you, be you know you know what time of year it is. It's lion season, man. You're gonna hear something. yeah. Yeah, so the, all that smoke that comes out, it's super hard to know. And, you know, watching him, you're talking about, again, big, tall, fast, super explosive. That's the kind of guy that you want. Um, the toughest ones for me are now where you get into the freaky athletes versus the good receivers. So Xavier Worthy and Troy Franklin are crazy fast, but really thin. And I'm, I'm torn on where that gets me versus – you know, Javon Baker and Jalen Polk are awesome receivers. I think their floor is so high. Like they're going to be good receivers in the NFL no matter what, but maybe not superstars. Maybe they won't turn into amazing wide receiver ones, but they're going to start for NFL teams for a long time. There's a chance Xavier Worthy or Troy Flankin are awesome, but they're also the guys who could bust out of the league if they can't play at 173 pounds or whatever the heck it is. So now you get into some of that kind of stuff. And then you get into the other tier where let's say they did decide to do a trade for like a Cortland Sutton or like someone more established outside. Well, now you open it up that Roman Wilson, Lad McConkey, guys like that, I think we're, uh, Ricky Pearsall are going to be really, really good. I don't think they're like the X outside receiver that we need, but you can tell me that those guys are all better than Xavier Worthy or Troy Franklin or that they check out better than the statistical profile for Xavier Leggett or some of the background stuff on A.D. Mitchell. Those guys are going to be really, really good. It's not exactly what we need. We already have Curtis Samuel and we already have uh, Xavier, you know, uh, Khalil Shakir and whatever you want to, you know, call. The the shoot. Yeah, you know, we got all those spots here and there. We need guys that can run the outside routes, can run a dig, can run a flag, can run a, a go route. We need guys who can run the outside routes. But if we pick that up somewhere else, maybe a veteran, go sign DJ Chark and I'll feel better about it. Um, then if they drafted Ricky Pearsall, I'd be like, yeah, that's fine. He's a good receiver. He's going he's gonna to play in this league and get open. 